Hello, thank you for watching. This is my lecture on books 7 through 12 of The Odyssey by Homer. Uh, and again, this is Professor Ryan St. Paul of AM University, Kingsville. So, just to catch you up and remind you of where we've been in books 1 through 6. Odysseus, the hero of the of the poem, has been lost for about nine years, almost ten years after the Trojan War. Um, his wife Penelope is beset by suitors who are trying to get her to remarry so that they can take her wealth and Odysseus's wealth. Um, his son Telemachus is frustrated by this and sets out to find news of his father. Uh, meanwhile, on the side of Odysseus himself, he's been stranded on the Isle of Calypso for seven years, and at the request of the goddess Athena, Zeus allows him to leave, tells Calypso that she has to let Odysseus leave, but Poseidon, who's still angry at Odysseus, um, sees him leaving, wrecks his boat, and he washes ashore on the kingdom of Phaeacia. Book seven, Phaeacia's Halls and Gardens. So Odysseus, um, who was found by Princess Nausicaa, um, the daughter of the king uh, of Phaeacia, uh, sets out for the palace after he has been bathed and given clothes by the princess. And along the way, he meets a young girl who, of course, is the goddess Athena, and she gives him directions in, in her disguise. She says, you go on inside, talking about the palace, be bold, nothing to fear. In every venture, the bold man comes off best. The queen is the first you'll light on in the halls. She lacks nothing in good sense and judgment. She can dissolve quarrels, even among men, whoever wins her sympathies. So Athena, in the disguise of this young girl, tells Odysseus, don't go to the king, but go first to the queen and beg her assistance. Let's pause for a moment over the genealogy of Alcinous and Arete. So there was uh, Eurymedon, who was the king of a uh, race of giants, and he, with an unnamed wife, had a daughter named Perabea. And Perabea was loved by Poseidon, the god Poseidon, and they gave birth to the child, or she gave birth, rather, to the child Nausithus. And Nausithus, who was the uh, original king of Phaeacia, he and his unnamed wife had two sons, Rexenor and Alcinous. Um, Alcinous, of course, is the current king of Phaeacia, son of Nausithus and current king. His brother Rexenor, um, with his unnamed wife, had a daughter named Arete, but Rexenor died, as did apparently his wife. And so Alcinous took his brother's daughter as his bride. So he married his own niece, and their child is the princess Nausicaa. As we've seen before, for example, when Telemachus visited uh, the palace of Menelaus, we see the glory of a king and the riches of this great king. Odysseus is, is stunned in wonder by how rich this palace is. And these are just a few of the lines describing the wealth of Alcinous. A radiant, strong as the moon, or rising sun came flooding, walls plated in bronze, solid golden doors, and dogs of gold and silver were stationed either side, forged by the god of fire with all his cunning craft. Just as Phaeacian men excel the world at sailing, so the women excel at all the arts of weaving. And there are many great tapestries and rugs and so forth there. And here luxuriant trees are always in their prime, and here is a teeming vineyard planted for the kings. So it's a palace of great wealth that Odysseus arrives in after his many years um, lost at sea. So Odysseus uh, takes the advice of both Nausicaa and the goddess Athena, and he seeks first the mercy of Queen Arete. The moment he flung his arms around Arete's knees, the god-sent mist rolled back to reveal the great man, and silence seized the feasters all along the hall. Here, after many trials, I come to beg for mercy, your husbands, yours, and all these feasters here. May the god endow them with fortune all their lives. May each hand down to his sons the riches in his house. So he begs before the queen Arete for her mercy, but also notice the blessing he lays upon them. That, of course, is pertinent to his own situation. May each hand down to his sons the riches in his house. 
And then we have a very funny but very human moment. Of course, Alcinous is a good host. He's hospitable. He says, welcome, uh, stranger. I will give you aid, as is my duty. Um, and Odysseus thanks them and says, yes, thank you so much. I've suffered a great deal, but I'm really hungry. Whom do you know most saddled down with sorrow? They are the ones I'd equal, grief for grief. But despite my misery, let me finish dinner. The belly's a shameless dog. There's nothing worse. Always insisting, pressing, it never lets us forget. Eat, drink, it blots out all the memory of my pain, commanding, fill me up. So, of course, we might think Odysseus has been lost for nine years. He's suffered. Um, he wants to go home. But there is the very real human uh, situation. That is, no matter what you've been through, if you're hungry, if you're starving, that's what you need to deal with first. We are, of course, physical bodies. We are animals and we need to survive. We need that physical survival. Um, and that is, of course, always our first instinct. So it's humorous, but rather realistic as well. We have a potentially awkward moment when the queen, Arete, notices that Odysseus's clothes are ones that she herself has made. And she says, where did you get those clothes if you are a stranger from another land? And he says, well, I was on the island of Calypso. She let me free. Then I was shipwrecked and I met your daughter Nausicaa and she's the one who clothed me. And the king says, well, that was good of her, but she failed in her hospitality because she didn't bring you here as she should have. But Odysseus is very politic. He's very sensible. He wants to make sure that he doesn't offend anyone. And he says, no, 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 don't um, blame your daughter. Uh, when Alcinous says, her good sense missed the mark, this daughter of mine, she never escorted you to our house with all her maids. Odysseus says, don't fi find fault with a flawless daughter now. She urged me herself to follow with her maids. Of course, we know this isn't true. She had said, she was the one who said he shouldn't come with her. I chose not to, fearing embarrassment, in fact. What if you took offense, seeing us both together? Suspicious we are, we men who walk the earth. Of course, we know it was Nausicaa herself who said, well, I don't want people to get um, the wrong idea if they see me with a strange man. But Odysseus Again, he's very cunning, he's a good speaker, he knows what to say to make people like him for the most part. So he says, oh no, she was great, I just didn't want to make, uh, uh, make her look bad or risk um, gossip. And then we see the traditional uh, bond exchange between the men, um, Alcinous who promises the aid of his fast ships to Odysseus, and Odysseus, of course, in response, as is proper, praises Alcinous and prays for him, says, I hope that, that good things come to you. And so he says, Father Zeus on high, may the king fulfill his promises one and all. Then his fame would ring through the fertile earth and never die, and I should reach my native land at last. So Alcinous offers aid as he's supposed to, of course, as a good host. And Odysseus says, yes, you should do this. I hope that you, that you fulfill your promise because um, that's what you're supposed to do. And if you do so, you will be famous because you're proving yourself to be a good king. So Odysseus holds Alcinous to his bond. Um, so we see the, that hospitality here is not just about being polite or friendly, but it's about cementing important social bonds and one's reputation. And so there is an obligation involved, even though people do it willingly. Some questions to consider. Um, Athena shields Odysseus from everyone's view as he's traveling from the beach into the palace. Why does she do so? And given her reasons, given the reasons that the poet um, ascribes to her, what does this suggest about the dangers of travel? And again, we wanna think about this as a world where there's no international police, there are no international laws. Um, there's no police forces really of any kind in any country. Um, so what does this tell us about the very real dangers of travel? And are there other similar moments or ideas uh, about the dangers of travel in this book, um, that is in book seven, or in the poem overall? Why does Odysseus ask Arete for help rather than her husband, the king? Why does he bow before the wife first? 
And how does this help us to understand, again, one thing I've talked about, the portrait of gender relationships and the role of women in Greek society that Homer is showing us in this poem? How does it help us to understand more fully the relationships between men and women and the power and authority that women had despite it being a patriarchal, that is, male-ruled society? Book eight, a day for songs and contests. So as is appropriate um, for a great king when they have a stranger to honor, Alcinous calls for a feast, a feast of celebration. And we are introduced to uh, the second bard that we've seen in this poem, the blind singer Demodocus. And of course, scholars have made much of Demodocus's presence given that Homer himself was rumored to be blind, is, is traditionally held to be blind. So perhaps Demodocus is a stand-in in some way for Homer himself. And we see, we read, in came the herald now, leading along the faithful bard, the muse adored above all others, true, but her gifts were mixed with good and evil both. She stripped him of sight, but gave the man the power of stirring rapturous song. So you might think about that trade-off, how his vision is gone, but he has another kind of vision in his ability to sing. And what are the differences between those two types of knowledge? The physical sight that he has lost, but the metaphysical poetic inspiration that allows him to see and sing of all the great deeds of heroes and gods. And what is that saying about um, the difference between, say, art and real life? And as we'll see many times in this book, Odysseus weeps. Demodocus sings a song of the strife between Odysseus and Achilles, Peleus' son. Um, at some point in the, in the uh, uh, Trojan War, there'd been a moment when Odysseus and Achilles had been angry with each other and argued. But Agamemnon was happy about this, we learn, because this argument was uh, prophesied to him as a sign that the Greeks would win over the Trojans. Uh, but when Odysseus hears this song, he becomes very sad, thinking of his lost friends. But Odysseus, clutching his flaring sea-blue cape, in both powerful hands, drew it over his head and buried his handsome face, ashamed his hosts might see him shedding tears. Whenever the rapt bard would pause in the song, he'd lift the cape from his head, wipe off his tears, and hoisting his double-handled cup, pour it out to the gods. So we might think, why does Odysseus hide himself? He says he's ashamed that they might see him shedding tears. But this also helps to hide his identity. Right? He's weeping at this song because it's about him and about his dead friend. And they don't know yet who he is. So he's also um, afraid perhaps to show them what his true identity is. So you may be aware that Athletics were extremely important in Greek culture as a way to prove one's manliness and also to honor the gods. Uh, you might compare this, for example, to medieval Europe where there'd be jousts and archery contests and things like that, um, these, these festivals in honor of great nobles. So Alcinous calls for a series of contests, games, in honor of their guest to entertain him and everyone else. And we have an example of an epic catalog a technique that I've mentioned in a previous lecture. This is a formal element that's frequently seen in epic poetry where the poet will list off uh, a long list of names of people or places or things like that. And so Homer lists the names of the young champions competing in these games. And as you'll see, these aren't realistic names. These aren't necessarily names of them as um, individuals. They're more uh, nicknames. What they really do is characterize them. They tell you what the person is good at because they're all about, um, as you can see, sailing. Top sail in riptide rows, the helmsmen row hard too, and seaman, and sternman, and surf at the beach, and stroke oar, breaker and bowsprit, racing the wind, and swing aboard, and seagirt, the son of great fleet, shipwright's son, and the son of launcher, broad sea rose up too. 
Laodamas rose with two more sons of great Alcinous, Halius bred to the sea, and Clythonius famed for ships. So only those last few are the names of actual people. The rest are nicknames, although they also sound a little bit like the names of G.I. Joe characters. So the young men compete in a number of sports. What's mentioned, uh, racing, foot racing, wrestling, jumping, that's something like hurdles or the long jump, uh, throwing the discus, and boxing. Um, and Laodamus, the son of Alcinous, asks Odysseus if, if he has the skill com to compete. And he says, you're a very big man, you're muscular, um, surely you compete at sports. But Broad Sea, and again, that's not necessarily uh, the character's real name. Um, it's, again, like a nickname that characterizes him, tells us what he's like. He taunts Odysseus. Um, Odysseus says, I don't want to compete, um, and Broadsea taunts him. He says, oh, I knew it, Broadsea broke in, mocking him to his face. I never took you for someone skilled in games, the kind that real men play throughout the world. Not a chance. You're some skipper of profiteers, roving the high seas, grabbing the gold he can. You're no athlete. I see that. So he says, you're not an athlete. You're not a real man. You're just some pirate that goes around trying to get gold. You're not a, a real man like I am. And of course, Odysseus, being the great hero that he is, and the great warrior that he is, does not find this funny. He's angry at Broadsea and chastises him, says, you're a young punk, basically. And he answers Broadsea with action. Up he sprang, cloak and all, and seized a discus, huge and heavy, more weighty by far than those the Phaeacians used to hurl and test each other. Wheeling round, he let loose with his great hand, and the stone whirred on, and down to the ground they went, those lords of the long oars and master mariners cringing under the rock's onrush, soaring lightly out of his grip, flying away past all the other marks. So when Broadsea says, you're no athlete, Odysseus basically says, oh, you want to bet? And he throws the heaviest discus even farther than any of the rest. And keeping with his epic heroism and his sense of pride and honor, he challenges all the rest. He says, all of you young guys, except for the son of the king, I don't want to offend him, I will beat you at any sport except for racing because I'm too old and have taken a beating on the seas. But if you want to throw the sp beer, if you want to wrestle, if you want to box, come at me and I will take you down. Um, so we see Odysseus's might and we see him displaying his manliness and heroism and of course his bold and brash nature. Um, everyone is silent for a moment, but the king lightens the mood. He says, hey, let's have some more song and dance. We're hardly world-class boxers or wrestlers, I admit, but we can race like the wind. We're champion sailors too. And always dear to our hearts, the feast, the lyre and dance, and changes of fresh clothes, our warm baths and beds. So he kind of says, yeah, you're right. You're much tougher than any of us. We wouldn't want to box you or wrestle you. We are very fast, but really, we like the good life. We like to enjoy things. So let's just have fun and listen to some more music and dance and eat some more good food. So the bard Demodocus comes and sings a rather humorous tale of the gods, the love of Ares and Aphrodite crowned with flowers. And so it's a story about how Aphrodite, who was married to Hephaestus, cheated on her husband with Ares, the god of war. And Hephaestus, who was the god of fire and the god of the forge, he was a great craftsman, um, but he was also disabled, he finds out about it and captures the two, and when he's got them trapped in his uh, subtle magic net, he shows them to all the other gods so that the, all the other gods can laugh at them. And he says, Father Zeus, look here, the rest of you happy gods who live forever, here is a sight to make you laugh, revolt you too. Just because I am crippled, Zeus's daughter Aphrodite will always spurn me and love that devastating Ares. They'll soon tire of bedding down together, but then my cunning chains will bind them fast till our father pays my bride gifts back in full, all I handed him for that shameless bitch, his daughter. So um, it's, it's a funny story, but it's also somewhat sad. Hephaestus is humiliated in front of everyone, um, as are Aphrodite and Ares, and he wants his dowry back. He wants what he paid to marry the, god of the goddess of love back. 
Uh, you might also note that Homer here draws on a different tradition than Hesiod. Hesiod had had Aphrodite born from the severed genitals of Uranus, but Homer uh, relies on another tradition where Aphrodite is just another daughter of Zeus. So it's a different genealogy. And so what that shows us again is that there was no one set um, uh, sto there was no one set official story in to any of these gods about any of these events in ancient Greece. And Homer and Hesiod and all the other writers are drawing on a diverse group of stories and trying to combine them into something coherent. After the bard's humorous story, um, we have the dancing of the Phaeacians, and Odysseus praises them because they are the greatest dancers in the world. And Alcinous and the other lords give their lavish gifts to Odysseus, as is proper, as they are um, supposed to do as good hosts. And even Broad Sea, who was humiliated after Odysseus uh, basically called him out, he makes amends by giving his sword to Odysseus. And Odysseus says, thank you, you've made amends, I forgive you, we are friends now. So everything is made all right in the end. But as King Alcinous told us, the Phaeacians love to party, so we have another feast. And at this one, Odysseus makes sure that the great bard receives his due honor. He cuts off the choicest cut of meat from the, uh, from the food, and he says, Here, Harold, take this choice cut to Demodocus so he can eat his fill, with warm regards from a man who knows what suffering is. From all who walk the earth, our bards deserve esteem and awe, for the muse herself has taught them paths of song. She loves the breed of harpers. So again, thinking about this as, in some way, Homer commenting upon himself or upon his own art, this is him in the middle of singing a song, saying, those people who sing songs deserve great honor. So he's, it's a little bit of self-promotion. Um, that's not to say that it's, you know, completely filled with ulterior motives, but there is this sense of self-promotion, of, of promoting just how important poetry and song is. And what would a feast be without more song? Demodocus sings finally now of the Trojan horse and the final conquest of Troy. We hear that story. Odysseus, of course, weeps some more. And Alcinous very sensitively sees that his guest is weeping and says, let's stop the song. We don't need to hear about suffering. Let's just have a good time. And then we have a, a moment of foreboding, a hint of the dangers to come. Alcinous remembers something that his father said about the fate of the Phaeacians. Nausithus used to say that Lord Poseidon was vexed with us because we escorted all mankind and never came to grief. He said that one day, as a well-built ship of ours sailed home on the misty sea from such a convoy, the god would crush it, yes, and pile a huge mountain round about our port. So the old king foretold. And as for the god, well, he can do his worst or leave it quite undone, whatever warms his heart. So this is a, a fascinating moment because they have this sense that if we keep helping people as we have, as we're supposed to, we'll ultimately be punished for it. But what can we do but continue to help those who come to us? As we are supposed to. What can we do but be hospitable even if the god ultimately punishes us. So it's an interesting moment because we see just how different the Greek understanding of the gods was from, say, modern religious understandings of the relationship between humans and the divine. They basically saying, well, we're going to do what we think is right because that's all we can do. And if it upsets the god, then it upsets the god and he'll punish us. Um, but without any sense that Poseidon is wrong to do this, or that it's right, um, just that that's what the gods do. They get angry and they punish humans sometimes, even if we don't understand why they do it. So um, this is a really important moment, I think, for understanding the Greek cosmology and Greek philosophy, what it means to be a human being in a harsh and often unforgiving world ruled by strange and sometimes um, vengeful gods. 
So some questions to consider. What role do the sports play in this narrative? Why are they an important part of the story? And what do they reveal, reveal about Greek ideas of masculinity and honor? And we'll see other similar events come up later in the poem. Um, why the repeated focus on Odysseus's grief and weeping? We see him weep at least three times in this one book. Do you think this undermines his heroism or manliness? Or does it show a different aspect of it? How is it important for us to really understand his character and his story? Uh, what do you think about the significance of the blind bard Demodocus, both as a stand-in for Homer or as a representative of um, poetry in general? What role does he play in the narrative? Why include him in the story? And again, what does he reveal about the role, the importance of poetry in Greek culture? And then thinking about the tales that he tells, in particular the story of Aphrodite, Ares, and Hephaestus, um, why that story? Why is that included here in the poem? Is it just a humorous interpolation, or does it somehow comment on Odysseus's own experiences and his marriage? What might this story mean to Odysseus at this point in his journeys? Book nine, in the one-eyed giant's cave. So now at the beginning of book nine, after Odysseus has been in Phaeacia for a while, he finally reveals who he is when they ask him to tell his story. And he says, now let me begin by telling you my name so you may know it well and I in times to come, if I can escape the fatal day, will be your host, your sworn friend, though my home is far from here. I am Odysseus son of Laertes, known to the world for every kind of craft. My fame has reached the skies. So he boldly announces who he is. He knows that he is a famous and great warrior, and he knows his own intelligence, his own cunning, and he brags about it, essentially. Um, but this is appropriate. This is what a great hero does. I am a great hero. This is what I'm great at. When Odysseus begins his tale, he tells us that the first thing he and his men did after leaving Troy was attack another city, Ismarus, the city of the Sicones. We don't learn why. There's no specific reason given. And it seems that the only reason is because that's what you do if you're a warrior. You attack other cities. That's what your job is. So they sack this other city and they take its wealth. But even though he wants to leave, his men refuse to leave. They want to enjoy their spoils. And so that gives time for the Sicones to counterattack and Odysseus and his men are forced to flee. They sail away, but a storm is sent by Zeus to torment his ships and they go off course. And they land on the land of the lotus eaters, which are, quote, people who eat the lotus, mellow fruit and flower. And his men go out in search and they find that the lotus eaters don't have any uh, uh, wishes to harm them or attack them, but any crewman who ate the lotus, the honey sweet fruit, lost all desire to send a message back, much less return. Their only wish to linger there with the lotus eaters, grazing on lotus, all memory of the journey home dissolved forever. But I brought them back, back to the hollowed ships and streaming tears, I forced them. So we have in this book, a repeated theme starting to emerge of Odysseus in conflict with his men, his men doing something wrong, failing in some way, uh, refusing to follow his commands and the various problems that that leads to. So after leaving the land of the Lotus Eaters, who again are people who basically just seem like they're stoned all the time, uh, they come to the land of the Cyclops, which is um, an interesting sort of utopia in another way. Lawless brutes who trust so to the everlasting gods, they never plant with their own hands or plow the soil. Unsown, unplowed, the earth teems with all they need, wheat, barley, and vines, swelled by the rains of Zeus, to yield a big, full-bodied wine from clustered grapes. 
They have no meeting place for counsel, no laws either. No, up on the mountain peaks, they live in arching caverns, each a law to himself, ruling his wives and children, not a care in the world for any neighbor. So it's interesting that Odysseus arrives at these two different lands, one after the other, the Lotus Eaters and then the Cyclops, that are very different from Greek society in terms of their values, in terms of their way of life. Um, and what is Homer saying here? How do these contrasting cultures bring out certain aspects of Greek civilization and Greek um, ideology? So they go to the island of the Cyclops and Odysseus leads his men in a search and they find a cave and inside they find a, a bunch of food that they want to eat. And Odysseus says, okay, we can eat the food, but we have to wait here for the host. We have to introduce ourselves to him and give him the opportunity to be hospitable because that's what's proper. So once more, Odysseus is in conflict with his sailors, uh, but here they seem to probably have had the better idea. So the Cyclops, who we learn later is Polyphemus, he comes home and finds these people in his house. And Odysseus introduces himself to them. He says, but since we've chanced on you, we're at your knees in hopes of a warm welcome, even a guest gift, the sort that hosts give strangers. That's the custom. Respect the gods, my friend. We're suppliants at your mercy. Zeus of the strangers guards all guests and suppliants. Strangers are sacred. Zeus will avenge their rights. So Odysseus seems rather demanding here, saying, hey, we're in your house, give us a gift. But he calls upon piety. He says, that's what is customary. That's what Zeus wants you to do. So you better do it. So even though he's demanding something, he's also giving Polyphemus the opportunity to be pious and to prove his generosity, to be a good person. How well does that work out for Odysseus? Not too well. Um, the Cyclops defies Zeus. He says, I don't care about Zeus. We're not going to do anything just because of him. We Cyclops never blink at Zeus and Zeus's shield of storm and thunder or any other blessed god. We've got more force by far. So he seems not too impressed by calling upon Zeus. Um, and it's very striking that he just defies Zeus openly. This is almost blasphemous. Um, how is it that he can get away with this? Well, as we'll see, he doesn't quite get away with it. But he then grabs up two of Odysseus's men and eats them. Uh, a, another theme that we'll see repeated throughout the next few books. And he traps the rest in the cave, planning to eat them all, um, you know, the next day, whenever he gets hungry. And now we see one of Odysseus's most famous plans as he uses his cunning to help them uh, escape from the Cyclops. So they get some of their wine, which is very powerful, good wine, and they give it to the Cyclops and get him drunk. And then when the Cyclops asks what his name is, Odysseus says his name is Nobody. Um, and he again asks the Cyclops for a gift. And Cyclops says, okay, you want a gift? Here's your gift. Nobody, I'll eat nobody last of all his friends. I'll eat the others first. That's my gift to you. So it's a rather ironic gift. But before he's able to do so, he passes out drunk because of the powerful wine that Odysseus has given him. And now we get the, it, what in many ways is the central event of the poem, one of the most crucial events, because it's for this that Odysseus um, has been shipwrecked for seven years on the island of Calypso. They take, they, they have uh, carved a stake out of one of uh, Polyphemus's clubs and then tempered it in the fire. And then they use it to blind the, the, the giant, the Cyclops. Hoisting high that olive stake with its stabbing point, straight into the monster's eye, they rammed it hard. I drove my weight on it from above and bored it home, till blood came boiling up around that smoking shaft, and the hot blast singed his brow and eyelids round the core, and the broiling eyeball burst, its crackling roots blazed and hissed. So it's a wonderful gruesome description of the eye being burst open by the by the um, red hot uh, uh, stabbing point of the spear. In this description also, there are a pair of epic similes, which is another important technique 
formal element of epic poetry. Um, as you should know, a simile is a comparison between two different things using the word like or as. So he was as hungry as a bear or um, he sang like a nightingale, something like that. Uh, an epic simile is the same thing, but it's just extended. It's just much longer. And this is used in epic poetry as a means of rich description to really um, communicate the ideas in an event in a more vivid way. So when he talks about how he bore the, the, the stabbing implement down into the Cyclops eye, he makes this simile. He compares it to as a shipwright bores his beam with a shipwright's drill that men below whipping the strap back and forth whirl and the drill keeps twisting faster, never stopping. So that's what it was like as they drove it into the eye of the Cyclops. And then on the sounds that the eye made as it burst and sizzled, it's as a blacksmith plunges a glowing ax or adds into an ice cold bath and the metal screeches steam and its temper hardens. That's the iron's strength. So these epic similes are there to make the, the action more vivid by comparing it to something that someone might have actually experienced. People who know what it's like to, to build a ship or who have seen a blacksmith at work, they can now imagine what it was like to blind this cyclops. And now in a, another rather funny but grim moment, we see why Odysseus told Polyphemus that his name was nobody. So Polyphemus is screaming in pain and his fellow Cyclopses come and they knock on the, the door of his cave and they say, what's going on in there? And he replies, nobody friends, Polyphemus bellowed back from his cave, nobody's killing me now by fraud and not by force. And so they say, oh, well, nobody's killing you, all right. If you're alone, his friends boom back at once, and nobody's trying to overpower you now. Look, it must be a plague sent here by mighty Zeus, and there's no escape from that. They lumbered off, but laughter filled my heart to think how nobody's name, my great cunning stroke, had duped them one and all. So it's it's a little silly, perhaps. It's almost a bit cartoonish. But it's, uh, again, another sign of just how clever Odysseus is that he gives a false name and thus Polyphemus, um, it, 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 he bites himself in the ass, so to speak, by um, saying, nobody's killing me. And say, well, if nobody's killing you, there's nothing we can do to help. Despite blinding Polyphemus, Odysseus and his men are still trapped in the cave. They're not strong enough to move aside the great boulder that blocks the opening. So how do they escape? Well, Odysseus comes up with another plan. They strap themselves to the underside of the Cyclops' sheep. And so in the morning, when he uh, puts aside the boulder and takes his sheep out to graze, they slip past him because they're underneath. And if he touches the tops of the sheep, he won't feel them. And as, as they get out, Odysseus taunts Polyphemus once more. So, Cyclops, no weak coward it was whose crew you bent to devour there in your vaulted cave. You with your brute force, your filthy crimes came down on your own head, you shameless cannibal, daring to eat your guests in your own house. So Zeus and the other gods have paid you back. Tells us a lot about Odysseus's character that he feels the need to take the time to mock Polyphemus. And another in what's a continuing series of uh, prophecies being fulfilled, specifically prophecies revolving uh, around Odysseus, Polyphemus suddenly remembers that he had been warned many years ago by another uh, Cyclops that a man named Odysseus would blind him. But Polyphemus never expected it to be a, a little human. He thought it'd be another great Cyclops like himself. But I always looked for a handsome giant man to cross my path, some fighter clad in power like armor plate. But now, look what a dwarf, a spineless good-for-nothing, stuns me with wine and gouges out my eye. Um, so there's also an interesting uh, moment here because Polyphemus, we see the relativity of beauty. To Polyphemus, Cyclopses are handsome, giants are handsome, um, but humans are these little ugly dwarves, whereas of course it's the exact opposite for Odysseus. The Cyclops is a great ugly being um, from Odysseus' per Odysseus's perspective. Uh, and then after remembering his prophecy, 
Polyphemus prays to Poseidon and says, don't let this man reach home. And if he does, make sure he only reaches home a broken man, uh, which we'll see repeated again and again in the next few books. Some questions to consider about book nine. What do we learn about the martial code and the what war means to the Greek culture when we see Odysseus sack the city of the Sicones? What does this tell us about what it means to be a warrior um, and the ethics of the heroic code? And how different is it from our modern understanding of war and what war should be for and when one should go to war? Um, Thinking about the epic similes that we noted, how do they help to capture the nature of the actions that Odysseus describes? And do they seem in any way ironic or strange given what they're being used to describe, what these similes are being compared to? And look for other epic similes throughout the poem, both in what you've already read and moving forward, and think about how they function, um, again, within the context of the situation that they're trying to describe. Looking at the lotus eaters and the cyclopses, how, does, how do their cultures, their civilizations contrast with Greek society and Greek values? Are their worlds, are their societies utopian and desirable? That is, are these places where you'd want to live? The lotus eaters seem to just eat fruit and chill. The cyclopses don't have to do any labor because the earth just produces all they need. But is this a good life? What is it? lacking when we think about the society that Odysseus comes from. Um, and why does Odysseus continue to taunt Polyphemus again and again? What does this tell us about him as a character? And that leads us to the final question. Are there some ways in which Odysseus's values, his hero heroism and masculinity and pride, in what ways do they cause him more trouble than good? In what ways are they more problems than aids in his quest?